Hello, everyone. My name is Ravi Bashal. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in the Chicagoland area. Um, I work at North Shore University Health System, where I serve as the director of outpatient hip and knee replacement. And I'm also on the faculty at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine um, in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, I would like to thank all of the attendees uh, for being here virtually. Uh, I apologize for not being able to join you live, but due to timing constraints, I have to do this as a recorded presentation. I would also like to sincerely thank Dr. Bagaria and Dr. Kenny uh, for asking me to participate in this uh, important discussion. Today, I'd like for us to talk a little bit about patient-specific instrumentation in total knee arthroplasty. When we think about total knees and what we want to do, our goal is to get a great outcome. And to achieve that goal, there are multiple challenges which lead to multiple opportunities. In general, in order for us to get a good outcome, what do we need? We need a great implant and we need good technique. Um, today's talk is gonna focus on the technique side of things. I think the implant is also critically important, uh, but we'll save that chat for another time and another day. When it comes to technique, what is it that we are looking for? Really what we want to be is accurate. We want to be able to hit our goals and to make sure that those goals are clinically relevant to having a good clinical outcome for the patient. And accuracy we know is important for both short and long-term outcomes. So anything that helps us achieve accuracy and therefore helps us achieve better outcomes should be something that we give thought to. Another portion of technique that is important to us as arthroplasty surgeons is efficiency. Why is efficiency important? Why is speed in the operating room or length of the case important? Well, of course it's important for outcomes. The longer that we're in the operating room, the longer that the patient is open, the more invasive we are, the worse the outcomes could potentially be. And outcomes, again, is what drives us, but there are other things that we must consider in the evolving healthcare world. And that includes cost, and frankly, your own satisfaction and, and, and happiness. Um, if we can provide solutions that make the case go easier for you, cost the hospital less money, and therefore the patient less money, uh, while still driving at least equal, or in this case, even better outcomes, it's something that we should really think about and consider. And I think that patient-specific instrumentation and 3D printed plastic molds for total knees really helps us get there. Again, outcome should be our primary guide in everything we do, but we should keep in these ideas of satisfaction and cost with us as well, because those are relevant uh, within the world of arthroplasty and orthopedics today. So why patient-specific instrumentation? Um, we have a great way of doing these with standard instrumentation, and we have relatively great outcomes. Why should we change? Well, I would point out that a modern day Tesla automobile looks a lot different than a Model T Ford. And if we just kept saying that we had a relatively good product, we would never innovate and never improve. So there is always an ability for us to do better. And we should keep that in mind. And we should keep that in mind for whatever the next iteration of technology is as well. And, and part of what I'm getting at here is uh, obviously, one of the things that we talk about a lot now and that's become very popular is robotics, which I'm also a fan of, which I also think is a technology that's going to continue to evolve and improve and help us be better surgeons. At this time, I think that patient-specific instrumentation also provides us with really useful, helpful technology. I don't think of it as in competition with robotics. I think of them as similar technologies that when we put these together gives us the best outcome. And I like to think of smartphones. If you think about the evolution of the cell phone in the past 20 years, we've gone from flip phone to an area of smartphones where we had Palm Pilots, we had Blackberries, we had iPhones. Some of you may be too young to remember some of those earlier versions, but they all had slightly different platforms and slightly different uh, interfaces. But at the end of the day, had the same goal of you know, improving our outcome when it came to communication and connectability. And what we've seen is by having multiple platforms, we continue to evolve to get the best possible product. And for me, when I started, I, I told myself that I wanted to really do my best with standard instrumentation backwards and forwards so I could get myself out of trouble anytime. So I knew what the quote computer was showing me and I, and I had enough clinical experience to make changes based on what I saw, not just what the computer was telling me. In general, I would always adjust my distal femoral cut angle um, intraoperatively based on my preoperative x-ray. So for varus knees, I would put less valgus into the distal femoral cut. Um, and for valgus knees, I put more valgus into the distal femoral cut. Um, 
I often found myself cheating in sclerotic bone. So if we had a really bad varus deformity, I'd find that on the medial side, even when I used the flat cut guide, inevitably the saw blade would kick up. I'd have some sclerotic bone there and I'd have to just cheat a little bit on that side. So I was doing, I was trying to do subtle adjustments of my technique using standard instrumentation, um, because I think that's important to getting a good outcome in a total knee. Um, but what I've come to realize is that technology allows me to do it more precisely, more accurately, um, and more reproducibly. Um, so I kind of uh, went, went, just went over this. Um, I use PSI as a tool to make accurate and dynamic adjustments. I've done probably about 2,000 knees since I did those first 300 total knees, and I use patient-specific instrumentation on, all of all, on, on almost all of them unless they have a contraindication to doing so. And, and for me, it's a tool. It's not a solution that replaces the surgeon. It's a tool that I use. It's like a golf club. Um, you know, everybody has different clubs for different situations and patient specific instrumentation with 3D printed plastic guides is a useful tool for me in uh, primary uh, uh, knee replacement surgery. Um, there are some obvious other parts. It's helpful when there's hardware in place. If, you, if it's going to be difficult to instrument the femoral canal, or if you're an intramedullary person on the tibia side, it can help. I don't think a patient-specific instrumentation is a blind plug and play. I don't think that it should be viewed as a tool to uh, make surgeons that don't know how to do total knees or don't know the principles of total knees, just make it automatic for them. I think that you have to know uh, more than the technology in some ways in order to really be able to harness it and use it uh, uh, most uh, safely, efficiently, and with the best outcomes. There's studies that have backed this up, and, and you can look through this, but in general, there are many meta, there are many studies, and this, this meta-analysis looked at these many studies, and it said there's better uh, accuracy, more efficient, potentially better satisfaction, right? So um, when people talk about outliers in the mechanical axis, they might, the follow-up question might be, well, is that clinically significant? And that's an excellent question, um, and I think it is. I don't think that it's, I don't think that we need to look at aseptic loosening is the only endpoint for uh, whether or not mechanical axis adjustments make a difference. I think that the way in which we do soft tissue releases and the way in which we handle severe deformities, which I'm going to show later in this talk, um, really uh, are influenced by that as well. So there's studies that have shown, there's studies that have shown that it's more efficient. We talk about cost and efficiency. And as you can see here, uh, this is a single sort of case study. You can see the fewer number of trays, you can see the ease of use that it takes. And that translates into shorter surgery for the patient, which is better for the patient, probably for the surgeon and certainly for the hospital and for cost. Uh, this is a case, uh, a cost saving study out of Minnesota that was done by a company, um, and it really showed a significant savings. If you if you think about OR time and turnover time and the cost that it takes to prepare trays, those are sometimes very difficult to discreetly obtain. Uh, but if you do a little bit of diligence like they did in this in this case study, uh, you can see that uh, you know you're saving almost a thousand dollars a case and fourteen hundred on a bilateral case. So um, you know we should be looking for ways to do this so that we can have longevity um, with what we want to do. We want our patient. We want to be able to continue to take care of our patients in an ever evolving cost constrained cost constrained world. So you know, listen. At the end of the day, what's the goal of a total knee? Restore mechanical alignment get the ligaments balanced, have good patellofemoral tracking, right? And it, this is not a secret. We need good balanced gaps. We want to recreate the motion of the knee. We're going to talk about approaches to severe deformity, but remember, this is the guiding principle. And that matters whether you're doing a severe, severe 20 degree varus knee or a, you know, quote, chip shot, eight degree varus knee. You guys already know this. Okay. But you know, when you have a varus deformity, obviously the medial side is tight uh, and you got to do medial releases to open that up. Uh, and on a valgus deformity, the lateral side is tight. You have a little bit more flexibility on the uh, uh, valgus knee because there are more structures that you can release laterally than medially. And what I'm referring to is the fact that once you get through that TPMCL and maybe hamstrings on the on the varus knees, that's when people start talking about quote, quote pie crusting or or other things like that, which are really just simple ways of saying you're kind of cutting the MCL, which I'm not a big fan of. Okay, as I said, you already knew most or all of this, and I want to focus a little bit on the technology. Why is this important? As I said, thinking through knees this way, thinking about how you want to adjust cut angles uh, uh, is important. And initially, you might think that it's only important for severe deformities because you almost need to have it to do the severe deformity cases. But as you become more and more used to and facile with it, you realize that it actually helps you do those 80 to 90 percent of knees in a better fashion as well. So if you didn't pay attention to this, you could still probably do 80 or 90 percent of total knees and do them well. Harnessing this technology for severe deformity really helps us with those cases, 
But then what happens is you come back and you say, wow, I can now do those cases that I thought I didn't need it for even better than I was doing them before. But let's talk about that other 10 or 20 percent of these, the more severe deformities and how technology can help us. Um, and again, we just got to remember the goal is balancing the forces. That's the goal. So what kind of cases are outliers? Here's a couple. Here's a severe valgus deformity on one side of the screen and a pretty significant varus deformity on the other. So you can see those and you know those are those are challenging cases. And you could go straight to a constrained implant, just kind of cut everything and, and see how it goes. But it'd be nice to use a primary implant for a host of reasons when we can and when it's appropriate. And I am not an advocate of making everything fit what I want. If something needs a constrained knee or a posterior stabilized knee versus a CR knee, whatever you're I'm going to do the right thing. But at the end of the day, I want my patients to have normal, natural feeling knees. And we know that as constraint goes up, that goes down. Uh, why are these outliers? As I said, in severe varus deformities, even after you do all your standard cuts, if you cut everything perpendicular and you cut the distal femur at seven degrees every time, um, there are often cases, especially in severe deformity, where the medial side is still tighter than the lateral. So now what do you do? Pie crusting I alluded to earlier, which I think is just a fancy word for cutting part of the MCL. You can do a medial astatectomy and take off some of the bone there. Again, sort of destabilizes the knee, doesn't make the kinematics normal because you're gonna put the tibia uh, base plate somewhere else. What are some other considerations that you have to think about in these bad varus deformities, that sclerotic medial bone? If you think you're cutting the tibia perpendicular and you have sclerotic medial bone, you're probably actually cutting it in a little bit of valgus. There's gonna be extra bone on the medial side. That's just gonna make your job harder because the medial side is the tight side. The saw blade kicks up and off of the guide. Sclerotic bone is also a poor cementation hose. So when you're talking about aseptic loosening, we wanna have good bone. So I have no problem dialing a degree or two of varus into the tibia cut, because at the end of the day, it's probably closer to 0.5 or one if you account for that sclerotic um, bone. And it's also giving me a better host to cement into. So if you don't do those things, what ends up happening is you kind of cram the joint. You get that nine or 10 millimeter plastic to fit in and you say, okay, this is stable and, it's, and, and, it, and it is, but it's because it's so tight medially that it's not even letting you gap laterally. Um, and you know, if you had a smaller plastic, you'd see, yeah, it's tighter medially than it is laterally. So um, using uh, our technology to adjust our cut angles on the bone can help with this in these uh, deformities. Valgus, you know, similar idea, obviously on the lateral side, we have more options um, than a varus knee because there's more soft tissue structures that we can cut posterior laterally, but we still can't cut them all. Same idea, you can have sclerotic lateral bone with these, the saw blade kicks off, again, it's a poor cementation host, and you can have the opposite effect where you're cramming it laterally and it's really loose medially. So again, our goal is to remember that the guiding principle for all total knees is balancing forces across the joint. How do we get there in outliers? As I said, I think adjusting your distal femoral cut angle helps. If you got a tight varus knee, the goal is to open up things medially, help yourself help yourself, put less valgus into your distal femoral cut, open up that medial side a little bit more. Don't just quote, always cut it at five, adjust it based on what you need. I also would consider adjusting the tibial cut by a degree or a degree and a half. And I'm not an advocate of putting things in three or four degrees of varus or valgus, but by adjusting a degree and a half, you can really help yourself. And remember, if you think you're cutting it at zero, you're probably under resecting it because the sclerotic bone causes the saw blade to kick off, which actually just makes your work harder than on a medial, on a varus knee, it's going to make the medial side even tighter. As I said, I'm not an advocate for extreme variation. We just want the balances, the, the forces balanced across the joint. So how can you do this? How can you get these one, one and a half degree adjustments? As I alluded to earlier, I used to try to do it with standard instrumentation, but it's challenging to do accurately. And as good as we are uh, or can be, we know that uh, automa automation and technology can help us do that. So robotics, patient specific, these are all ways that we can do it. The purpose of this is to talk about patient specific, which I think is really a great technology. I don't want it to get lost in the, in the noise because of robotics. I think that they're complementary technologies. Um, interestingly, this also forces you to plan pre-op. Obviously, we template all of our hips, or at least most of us do. Many people don't think about their knees. Uh, this helps you plan pre-op, even on the easy ones. So even if I only have a five or seven degree varus deformity, adding just a degree or, uh, sorry, a, a tenth or a half a degree into the plan really helps me do a better job on my, quote, standard primary knees. So my performance has improved on these knees. So let's get to the cases, okay? So here's a severe varus deformity. If we look at my preoperative plan, we can see that we have 16.6 .6 degrees of varus, okay, preoperatively. And you can see what I did. The mechanical axis of the femur before was 4.6. 
I actually cut it at four. So instead of cutting it at five, six, or seven, I cut it at four. I didn't want to go below that. So I only quote added a, uh, about 0. 0.6 degrees of, of varus into the, the, fem, uh, the distal femoral cut. And then you can see that on the tibia side, I added two degrees of varus because of how severe this deformity was. I can look at my plan. I can figure out exactly how I, how I do it. Um, I think that the implant matters. You can see that I use a knee that has an asymmetric polyethylene and a kinematically matched femoral component. I think that's also important, but even if you don't use that implant, these principles still apply. And then there we are post-op. Um, and I think that looks pretty good uh, for, for a standard knee. You can see that our polyethylene is a little bit thicker, but that's intentional. We intentionally resected a little bit more in order to help through that. And, and, and so we're okay with that. Um, and, it, and it looks good. And this patient did extremely well without needing to do a constrained implant. Um, and again, I, if you want to do a PS knee, that's fine too. I don't think that that's not what the point of this is. It's just showing that technology can help us get to good outcomes and outliers. Here's that same, here's a valgus knee, the one that you've been looking at. You can see that the pre-op deformity is 18.6 degrees of valgus. And you can see here that I've taken the mechanical axis and added 0.4 of, val of valgus. So it was 5.6 and we added it. So we cut it at six. And then I added two degrees into the tibia. When I did that, that was our outcome. I'm sorry, it looks like that part of that x-ray got cut off there. But again, a good clinical outcome and a good x-ray. And ultimately, these x-rays, they don't look wacky. I don't think they look really weird where the tibia shifted one way or the other. Uh, but I would also say that if, even if I was trying to achieve this philosophically with standard instrumentation, it's very hard to be as precise and as accurate as I can be with patient-specific instrumentation and 3D printed guides. So as I said, you should consider technology when you're trying to achieve fine adjustments. And it doesn't, you can start by using this for your outliers, but as you do more and more, it forces you to plan. And I think we end up doing a better job even on the easy ones, okay? I think it helps us do a better job because if you don't need to release that whole DPM MCL, maybe you just add a half degree of varus into the tibia and a half degree into the femur. If that allows you to not release all the deep MCL, that patient's gonna feel more kinematically matched. They're gonna have less pain. They're gonna recover more quickly, all right? So just remember the guiding principles balance the forces. However you get there, whether it be with soft tissue release or with bony with bony resection, if the, if the forces are balanced across the joint, we're going to have a good outcome as long as we have a good implant, which is important. Again, we have data that backs this up. And I like this idea of that all total joint patients are high consequence. We don't have infinite dollars and technology costs money, but elective total joints are high consequence patients. We can't afford in many ways for them to have poor outcomes. They're not coming to us with open tibia fractures from a motor vehicle accident. These are people that are coming to see us for an elective surgery, and we need to do everything we can to make it as good of an outcome for them as possible. And I think that PSI helps me do that. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for your time. I apologize that I can't um, be there for the live discussion, but this is my lovely city of Chicago. It actually looks like this today. It's beautiful weather. If you come here, here in December, it might look a di little different. Uh, for those of you that are coming to the Academy meeting, it is in Chicago this March, and it'll be cold and snowy, but Remember, we're beautiful in the summertime here. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions via email um, or text. The, the moderators of this um, have my information. Thank you again for your time and have a wonderful rest of this virtual meeting.